Greetings, everyone. Happy Monday, April 8th here on the Wolverine.com YouTube channel. If you're watching live, if you're listening after the fact or watching us on our website at the Wolverine.com, Anthony Broom here with Clayton Safey and Chris Ballas, as we are every Monday night at 6 p.m. Uh, a lot to discuss. Uh, obviously, Dusty May in Michigan basketball. Very busy as he continues to put his staff together. Uh, Transfer portal board is starting to get a little full, a lot of options to pick from, a lot of spots to fill. So uh, we'll discuss a lot of that. Also, we're kind of rounding the home stretch here in spring ball. Figure this is going to be a pretty big week for for those guys uh, ahead of next week, which will be uh, the spring game a week from Saturday. So we'll get to that. And also, as we do every week, uh, we'll get to your questions at the end of the show. So, fellas, welcome back. I hope that, um, you know, I hope you guys are able to see me we can see each other. I know there was a lot of staring directly at the sun that was taking place today. Uh, Clayton's got his. Are those ISO certified, Clayton? They are. You know they are. I showed them. To I, know they are. <laughs> I know they are. I know that. The sun is my. Um, uh, the sun's my favorite planet. What's yours, Anthony? Uh, Pluto. Mine's the moon. So. <laughs> You're supposed to go back to the Harry Carey uh, skit on Saturday Night Live. Oh, if the moon was made of spare ribs, would you eat it? Right. It's a simple question, Doctor. Yeah. So uh, uh, Harry Carey staring at the sun. He said, I used to stare at that thing for hours. So burn my eyes. How cool was that, though? How cool yeah, was that? It, was it got real It uh, dipped about 15 to 20 degrees real quick. It got, you know, about dusk looking around these parts. So they said, uh, in, not Columbus, quite, they said in Columbus the smell changed. And I'm like, well, you know, so it probably got better. Yeah. You know? But uh, they said everything was different. It was weird because they had the full eclipse there. So, but enough about eclipses. Let's talk Michigan football, eh? Well, we'll, we'll start with basketball. We'll do that, um, too. We'll, we'll start with basketball tonight. Uh, a lot to talk about on that front, of course. Uh, Dusty is a busy man. Uh, Chris, you referred to him to his face as a basketball junkie. And he is, my oh my, is he ever getting after it right now? Uh, looks like Mike Boyton is, is ready to join the staff. Uh, Akeem Miskadine from Georgia is going to join. Uh, I believe uh, you reported earlier that Kyle Church, I believe, is maybe that third guy. So why don't you start us off with where things stand there? And uh, also, you know, they posted that special assistant to the head coach job a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you have any insight on that either, but it seems like things are starting to come together. And, you know, you have people on the message board or people on social media saying, Oh, well, the coaching staff's all fine and good, but they need to put a roster together. It's April 8th, but where are things at right now with all that? And it's a dead period, right? So a lot of these guys are going to start visiting. Uh, Dante Maddox Jr. from Toledo is going to be visiting next week. Connor Sejan, we've heard, is going to be visiting next week. So they're starting to line up visits. We've heard really good things about Vlad Golden coming, seven-foot center. That's a great place to start, right? Great piece to have if you're going to build a team. I think Namari Burnett's going to be coming back. We had heard that he could enter the – NBA draft just to kind of get some feedback and then come back to school. I'm not sure. I don't think it's, I've seen his name there yet uh, following the Terrence Williams Jr. path, but I do expect him back. So there are going to be some pieces there. Got to get a point guard. Janelle Davis is in demand, fellas. Uh, this could be a tough pull. And in fact, Dusty May has been telling people, hey, yeah, probably one or two guys coming from Florida Atlantic. I think the two depends on what happens with Davis, but they need a guard. And I've seen some didn't you guys see the, the numbers like a million bucks or something they said that he might command, which I think is ridiculous. I think that's probably inflated. But at the same time, it's clear that there are other schools with money to spend out there. Louisville is not going to be holding anything back. They're going to be trying to get some guys like Davis into the fold. So Michigan's going to have their work cut out for him. But I will say this, uh, nobody's going to work harder than Dusty Man. I think we've seen that in the early going. One of my buddies who used to work with him at Eastern Michigan said, you're, you're not going to believe the work ethic on this guy. And that's exactly what we have seen from him. He's been in to see Danny Wolf at Yale. So he's also been in to see, uh, I don't think he's been, yeah, I think he was in to see Maddox. Somebody spotted him in Toledo. So excited about the future of Michigan basketball again uh, at the end of last year. I'll be honest, guys. Would you see me at four games last year? If that, and I think I left two of them early. So, uh, or at least before the final press conference. So I was done with it. And I think a lot of other people were too. Yeah. I like the way the staffs come together. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. You wondered if it was going to be his entire staff from Florida Atlantic, or if it was going to be, you know, maybe Saudi Washington staying Well, it's, you know, a little bit of a, a mix, but no holdovers. Um, you know, it, it seems like, um, you know, we'll see what happens with the support staff either way as well. But Mike Boynton, I mean, a guy who's been a head coach, a really high level recruiter, 
uh, just a great relationship guy. I talked to an Oklahoma State writer last week who, you know, had really good things to say just about the the kind of person he is. You know, his wife Jenny was the the nutritionist on staff as well. I wonder if you know they'll hire her to a similar role here at Michigan. She was a star volleyball player at West Ottawa High School on the west side of the state. So he has eyes there, even though he's you know a New York guy through and through. But um, you know, apparently, you know, he can kind of he's kind of a chameleon. You know, can kind of fit in wherever and the fact that he was so beloved even though they weren't winning enough at Oklahoma State you know tells you what kind of a person he is and then Akeem Miskadeen uh from Georgia you know one of those guys that helped build Florida Atlantic that you know could be an x factor in that Nellie Davis recruitment because he brought him to Boca Raton um and, and has a great relationship to him now everyone's seen the photo that the now famous photo of uh, Akeem Miskadeen you know hugging uh, Nellie Davis after the Elite Eight game against Kansas State last year, that's the type of relationship they have. And, and he was on the, the Georgia staff at the time, but he was there watching and, and supporting those guys. And then Cal Church as well, another guy who's been with Dusty for a long time. So known friends and trusted agents coming. And then Mike Boynton, Boynton who was kind of like that best available type of guy, right? And I think that said a lot about Dusty May and what he wants to build, that he's not just bringing – it would have been easy to just bring everyone from Boca Raton to Ann Arbor, but he wants the best. And, uh, you know, I feel like he's, he's starting to show that. I thought you made a great post on the message board about that, Clay. It would have been easy. Just say, hey, I'm bringing my guys with me. Right. Instead, he went out and got some elite recruiters. It's going to be a, a mix. Kyle Church is somebody that Dusty May was talking about to people last night that he's bringing with him. So um, I think Kyle Church will do a good job here, too. And one of his other staffers is director of basketball operations. So still a couple of uh, slots to fill, fellas. But I like the way it's coming together. More than anything, though, and I'll say it again, is I love the fact that Dusty May is so hands-on. Uh, he was actually in a, in a conference call with a lot of donors and former players yesterday and things, too. So this guy gets it. This guy understands what it takes to win at this level. There are a lot of guys that don't want to coach in college anymore because they don't want to deal with NIL. They don't want to deal with the recruiting. This guy's just the opposite. And this is a guy, type of guy that you need to succeed at this level in this day and age. Yeah, I want to I want to hone in on the Mike Boynton um, hire for a second here, because to me, I mean, yeah, I know a lot of people in the immediate aftermath of, you know, a guy like Luke uh, Luke Yaklich coming available, you're like, oh, we'll go get this guy and, you know, put him on staff. They need to focus back on defense. The thing I like the most about Boynton, and again, these Oklahoma State teams, while he recruited well, and obviously he's best known for, for pulling uh, Cade Cunningham, uh, who was a number one prospect, wound up being the number one overall pick. You know, the thing that I like about his chops is – a defensive identity. He's going to be the guy that that sets that on that side of the ball. Uh, I had the post up here somewhere. This is what happens when I do stuff live and then have a million tabs open. But I think uh, before this year, Oklahoma State had a three-year stretch where they were in the top 17 or top 20 on defense three years in a row. And uh, that's kind of what his team's calling card have been. They've never really been elite offensively. So if you have that guy as kind of your defensive coordinator – Obviously, also kind of an ace recruiter, too, uh, you know, given it wasn't just Cade Cunningham. I think they got like seven or eight top, you know, 120 guys, which, you know, Oklahoma State's not exactly a basketball hotbed either. So uh, did a really nice did a really nice job there overall. Um, some some bigger issues than than the job he was doing led to him parting ways uh, with Oklahoma State. But to have that guy on your bench as you know your defensive coordinator, he's 42 years old. He's a guy who's got a lot of energy, someone who, you know, again, obviously no ties to Dusty May coming into this job. But when you, when you look, talk about work ethic and you talk about being tireless on the trail and tireless and building relationships, you know, Dusty and Dusty and, and whoever else he brings in to run the offense, uh, they're going to be just fine there. But having that defensive presence, I do have it here now. Um, Oklahoma State had a three year stretch where they were 17th, 14th and 12th, uh, respectively, in defense defensive efficiency on Kempom. So um, pretty darn good guy in that regard, if that's going to be what he's uh, in charge of. And with Miskadeen too, I mean, something that has been talked about, obviously the connection with Nellie Davis could help, but he's also the guy that, you know, when uh, can I root, uh, can I Ruth uh, decommits from Michigan? Everyone thought this guy, oh, well, Georgia's Georgia's in on this guy and, and maybe he's going to head to Athens now. Well, Miskadeem is his lead recruiter there. So all of a sudden, you kind of rekindle that relationship, and maybe maybe that's a guy you're able to get back in the fold now. So 
Um, you know, outside of the obvious encore implications, with some of these hires, there are obvious, you know, roster building implications as well, which I think shows a good, you know, shows good conviction with not only helping fill some needs in the short term, but also the long term vision as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, Boynton, it's funny because when he was first announced, um, you know, reaching out to sources and they said, well, the ball is still in his court. And uh, that's something that Tony Ortiz wrote at the Detroit Free Press as well. We must have been must have been talking to the same people. But um, last night, Boynton was actually uh, involved, I guess, uh, in dealing with some people that we know. So uh, is excited to be here, uh, said that there were a lot of places that he could be. Right. There were a lot of people that reached out to him, as you guys can probably imagine. And the fact that he chose Dusty May in Michigan is just another really indication that uh, that Dusty May nailed it here and uh, or that Ward Manual and company nailed it with a Dusty May hire. So um, love the fact that people are kind of gravitating to him. I love the impression that he's made on a lot of these kids. Uh, we're going to be talking to a lot of these portal guys as well. Um, it's funny. Uh, it was Darrell Brook Brooks who told our Clayton safety safety that he's going to be back um, next year, uh, that he's going to be actually join the program after committing. So um, honors his commitment and there's going to be a nice mix there, I think. So, but again, guys, I still, I just can't wait to see what that first team is going to look like. I do expect them to be competitive and I don't, you know, who knows if that, what that means. I keep, people keep asking me that. Does that mean NCAA tournament in the first year? Does that mean competing for a big 10? I would say the former, right. That at least get in there and get, um, you know, be, be competitive enough that you can compete for a, a tournament berth. Yeah. And if you are competing for a tournament berth, you might be competing for the big 10. I mean, two years ago, going into, you know, a few games left in the season, Michigan was tied for second in the big 10, despite being a really underwhelming team that ended up missing the tournament. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy by any means, but like you can get in the mix pretty quickly. Um, way too early. Yeah. Everyone asks, you know, how are they going to do, or do you think they make the tournament? they have four players like they don't even have a starting five at this point so we'll see how it goes in terms of who they pick up but i mean you said it like the indications like every box that dusty may could check so far you know in terms of things he's doing and in terms of you know just other indicators like a mike boynton joining the staff have been really positive uh so yeah i'm excited dead period ends midweek here they can get guys on campus and then I think you'll start to see more movement in, in some commitments on the transfer portal front. Then you start to get a clear picture of, okay, this domino falls. Now what more do they need? It's hard to say exactly at this point when you don't have anybody in the fold and it's like, all right, is this kid you know, going to be good enough? Uh, or is that kid going to be good enough? Well, we don't know what role they're going to play based on who else they get. So that's going to be really fun to follow, you know, all the different moves as we go forward. Something else maybe to keep an eye on too. I mean, we talk about this, board expanding each day with the transfer portal guys, guys becoming available. You know, I'm curious, you know, there's the coaching carousel is still going on. And now when you have a seismic move, like, you know, John Calipari going to Kentucky, you know, it's, it's everything down from, you know, the, the USC guys who, you know, Eric Musselman's there now, like there are all these pieces that are still, um, you know, does, does a guy, does Calipari in Arkansas, you know, get, involved with a Nelly Davis or do guys from Arkansas that were maybe high school recruits ask out of their letters of intent and become back in place. So uh, to me, I mean, there's a lot still to sort out uh, this board. I think we'll probably keep expanding before it. Uh, we have any clarity on who's coming yet, but um, let's take this one from John Cook really quick, who, who says update on any portal commits. I mean, again, with the, the board being as wide as it is, I would say, you know, are there maybe two or three names right now? You know, we've heard Vlad Golden. We know all of the uh, FAU guys. And uh, Elijah Martin went in the portal with a do not contact tag, which oftentimes means the guy knows where he's going too. So I guess who are some other names outside of those FAU guys that we should be looking at? Yeah, Golden is one that we talked about earlier. I think he's coming. Um, I, you know, barring some crazy offer thrown at him. Uh, I think, And then the two guys that we know that are visiting are Connor Asijan and Dante Maddox. Uh, I think uh, Kerry Booth is another one that we will watch closely. Uh, it is very clear that he likes Michigan. He likes the way they play. He's one of the five. So um, I would say as we see, as the visits are set up, that's when we're really going to get a better idea of who they're really, really serious about right now. It's kind of taking names, seeing who's interested. And then when you get them on campus, it's about seeing the fit. So those are the three right now. I think you'll see Namari Burnett on this team. I think you'll see Will Cheddar on this team. Maybe Terrence Williams comes back. Who knows? 
Uh, what were some of the other teams on his list? And I see Notre Dame on his list as well earlier today. So when he uh, actually put out a list, so, but those are the ones right now. And, uh, you know, we're obviously we're keeping an eye on uh, Janelle Davis as well. That one could go a little bit longer. I think he's going to go through the NBA process yeah. and see how high that money can and gets fellas. Uh, it's going to go up and up as teams get more and more desperate here for players. Yeah. And Nelly Davis is an incredible player as well. He's the number three player in the transfer portal right now, according to on three. And I mean, watching him play over the last couple of years, he's, he's kind of the straw that, that stirred the drink when it comes to what FAU did. And, you know, a guy that literally, I mean, could come in and be first, second team, all big 10, in my opinion, on a, on a Michigan team uh, next year or any team next year, first team, all conference, wherever at a high major or go to the NBA, um, you know, probably not going to be drafted or maybe second round or whatever, but, like you said, he'll go through that process. And then the interesting question, too, becomes you get Vlad Golden. Michigan would certainly want to still add Danny Wolf, the seven-footer from Yale. Would he want to come and play with Vlad Golden? Michigan needs a couple big guys, you know, so I think that they certainly could fit together uh, and, and kind of complement each other, not necessarily on the floor at the same time. But that'll be kind of an interesting domino, too, because you could be pretty set at center, which is kind of ironic, too, right, given, uh, you know, Michigan had – had bigs under Jawan Howard. They didn't have as many guards maybe as they needed, but it'd be kind of funny if, if uh, Dusty solidifies the center spot right away, and maybe that's how it'll go. Um, it'll just be a coincidence, but he'd be another uh, good addition as well, guy who can can shoot, can kind of do it all from the center spot and plays a little bit differently than, than Vlad Golden. Yeah, really quick on Terrence Williams. Uh, he told uh, High School Hoops, I believe was the account, that – he is hearing from Michigan, Butler, Vanderbilt, Pitt, St. John's, Louisville, UCLA, USC, VCU, Notre Dame, UCF, and Xavier. So obviously he uh, declares for the NBA draft and enters the portal last week with the option of returning. So I think that there is probably a spot for him on this roster somewhere. Uh, so we'll see. Any other thoughts on hoops or where things stand right now? I mean, we I think we pretty much laid it out here. I think we got it covered, fellas, uh, except for Go Boilers tonight. I know Clay isn't rooting for them. And uh, but I like Matt, I like Matt Painter and I like uh, his program. I like Purdue. So uh, I don't think they'll win, but I do like them to uh, be competitive in this game. Clay, tell us why you hate Purdue. Go Huskies. I don't hate Purdue. Just, you know, you don't want another Big Ten team to to get one. Uh, definitely not. And, and go Huskies. Nothing not to like about Dan Hurley and, and UConn and, and Donovan Klingen, uh, fan of his as well. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be an exciting game. First time two seven footers have started a national title game since Akeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing. So, which is pretty uh, wow. incredible. Um, is so, incredible. I think we're gonna get a good title game. We haven't always had great title games. Unfortunately, that Villanova team was was pretty incredible, and Dante Divincenzo went off. Had a great title game in 2013 with Michigan. Should have won it if they would have had some better calls. But I'm excited for a hopefully a good game on Monday night. Hopefully, it doesn't start you know much past 9:20. Anthony, you rooting for the Boilers? No. Go okay. UConn. I can't stand watching the way they officiate Zach Eady. It's an abomination, wow. honestly. Makes me sick. Uh, so, yeah, go UConn. I, I have them. Uh, All right. I might put a little scratch on that one, actually. Okay. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Let's move on to the football side of things. Uh, Chris, you were busy Monday with a couple inside the forts. Uh, a lot of intel coming out. You know, as we head into – Maybe the home stretch isn't the right word for it, but uh, I think as of Thursday or Friday, we had officially hit the halfway point. And this is kind of where, you know, you see guys move up the depth chart. You see some guys maybe start to position themselves for entering the transfer portal, whatever it may be. Um, I wanted to play a little, and, and it's not not exactly a game, but a little exercise of, of things we know and things that haven't been decided yet sure. on both sides of the ball. So we'll start with the offense and – with the offense comes the quarterback situation. I know you had some stuff to say about that on Monday. Uh, right now, it's still kind of it seems like the name we continue to hear the most is Alex Orgy, but at the same time, uh, you're not really hearing news of anyone running away with it just yet. No, and he's made a lot of mistakes, been very inconsistent. Even those who are in a position to be mouthpieces of the program are saying the same thing that you know he's got to make the easy plays too, man. You know, there are times that he gets out of the pocket, he'll make an outstanding play throw the ball down the field more than anything. We're hearing about 
a lack of explosive plays. And the one really comment that stood out to me yesterday from a guy at practice was uh, getting first downs is a win right now for this offense against this defense, because that's how good the defense is. So the good news is, is they're going against one of the best defenses in the country, fellas. The bad news is, is a couple of guys have been banged up on the offensive line and haven't played a whole heck of a lot. Uh, the quarterbacks, in my opinion, and I've said it all along, they're probably going to have to go to the portal and find somebody in that late, uh, portal period because I just don't see the starting quarterback of a championship team on this team. And you would hate to waste a defense like that on a guy, you know, you'd, you'd hate to be Iowa esque, I guess is what I would call it. So the offensive line is going to be better. And I don't mean they're going to be as bad as Iowa. There's no way they got better backs. They got a better offensive line, but you want a quarterback that can throw a little bit too. And I don't think they have that right now. And I don't think Jack Tuttle's the answer either. Everybody talks about, well, he's hurt. He's going to come back. Jack Tuttle couldn't earn the starting job at Indiana. He's in his seventh year now. He still hasn't started anywhere. Why do we expect him to be the savior of this program or the guy that's going to lead this program to a potential Big Ten title? So that's my concern. I think the receivers, from what we've heard, are playing well. You can go for more details at thewolverine.com in our report today. Uh, but that defense, guys, is nasty. And there's Max Bredesen, who is ha having one hell of a spring as well. Yeah, the, the five receivers uh, on the roster playing well. I think they got to maybe add yeah. some there as well. A couple of the freshmen, both of them coming in in the summer. But I think, you know, I don't think there's any danger. And in, in, I know you you just said it, too, of being Iowa. But I think there's danger of maybe being a 2017 Michigan offense where you just didn't have any juice to it. And first downs did feel like a win. And I mean that, you know, granted, they had issues with health at quarterback, but you know, I, looking at the numbers again, like Grant Perry led the team in receiving with like 300 yards. You know, it just wasn't. And there was that long stretch they had without a passing touchdown to a wide receiver. Most of them were to the tight ends. I think Sean McCune was second in receiving with like right around 300 as well. Like there are more weapons on this Michigan team than there was on that 2017 Michigan team. But you, you just don't want to get in the territory without a great quarterback uh, of, you know, kind of having to rely on a defense that was great. But I mean, would you guys agree? Like, they they wasted that defense in 2017. 100%. Yeah, and you don't want that to happen again, and there's no reason for them to. You know what? Uh, there are, You should be back-channeling right now, and I don't care about whose feelings get hurt. With all due respect to guys like Alex Orgy, who they tried to make a kick returner at the beginning of the year, right, and tried to find different ways to get him on the field, um, you've got to – you owe it to all your other guys on this team to, to field the best quarterback that you can. And I do think he's out there and everybody says, well, who are you going to find, you know, and you're just going to get somebody's leftovers. Yeah. Like a Jake Rudock, maybe who came in and threw for 3000 yards. And everybody's like, well, you're going to be giving up that Texas game. If you don't go with a guy that's already here. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, that's a home game. And the new quarterback, if he comes in, is going to have one under his belt. Right. Number two, uh, they're not starting at Utah like Rudock did. They're not starting at Notre Dame like Shea Patterson did, for example. So, uh, and if you find the right guy and let him bust his ass over the summer to learn that offense and work with those receivers, it certainly can work. So uh, that to me is the play. They need to be right now back channeling and figuring out who that's going to be. Tell kids, hey, you want to come and play for a Big Ten champion three times in a row and a national champion with a defense that is going to get you the ball back often, early and often, uh, this is the place for you. Yeah, the thing of it too is that you know it's not outside of Jaden Davis, who I think in time can be you know a Cade McNamara type or a Shea Patterson type. Um, you know, it's not there was a there was a conversation our, on our board earlier where people were like, well, what would be the harm in just throwing him out there? And it's not just as simple as oh, well, you know, just get him experience and he learns. Like there's the whole different level of the game. There's processing speed. There's improving your pocket presence. There's Improving your athleticism, which is something we've heard that, you know, Michigan wants to do with him behind the scenes. So, you know, again, it uh, takes time. I just imagine he's probably on ice this year. And, you know, if you – to me, that would be waving the white flag on what you think this team could do is, oh, well, just because we don't have a quarterback, let's just have it be a lost year where we get some guy – get a guy some reps. There's a lot of good – there's a lot of good talent, on, even on offense, even though a lot of these guys didn't play a ton last year. Um you know, you still have a window here to attack this and, um, you know, make a push for a Big Ten title. See how you'd fare in a 12-team playoff. So, you know, I've, I've kind of been looking around at some of these other schools with quarterback battles, and there's not a whole lot of intel out there in terms of who guys might be. But, yeah, I mean, if you're a guy at a school 
that is in a quarterback battle with like an upperclassman guy who is in a battle with, you know, a, a five-star recruit or something like that. And you can just come in and be a steady presence. Like I think I like the Jake Rudock comparison. I think that it's the overtures should be made that, Hey, you don't have to battle it out with these guys that these coaches on the hot seat are going to be pressured to play if they don't win right away. Like come here, compete for a big 10 title, play for a defending national champion and, uh, We'll see if they can't even get you to the NFL too. Yeah, without a doubt. And that guy's out there. Go find him, fellas. And you know what? You can worry about your guys going into the portal too. But at the same time, like I said, you owe it to your team to get the best guy out there. And yeah, we would all like to see the next JJ McCarthy and that guy that they are growing within the program, recruiting him and kind of grooming him. But that's not the case. It just hasn't happened. And uh, and it's tough. It is tough to recruit a guy to follow J.J. McCarthy. All these guys want to play early. Look at Dante Moore. Look at every one of them. But there are schools where there's going to be a number two guy that's going to be like, I can go to Michigan and I can start. And really, they need to start laying that groundwork right now. All right. Well, other takeaways on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, seems like uh, Clayton, earlier today, we talked to Josh Preeb. So we finally got some clarification on the correct pronunciation of that name, but um, not a whole lot to glean in terms of, you know, we try to get maybe what those offensive line combos have looked like, but uh, you know, Josh pre seems like he's fit in real well. Sounds like he's been one of their better uh, offensive linemen during this uh, spring camp so far. Uh, Max Bredesen is a guy who I think they're going to ask him to do pretty much whatever it takes, you know, maybe, you know, be that fullback H back type of guy while also playing some tight end. Um, you know, any other takeaways on offense from the last few weeks? I, I feel like running back Donovan Edwards, Kalel Mullings, it's pretty clear. That's the one, a one B that's being repped right now. I know there's been some hype for Ben Hall, but to me, it's pretty clear. Those two guys are, are pretty firmly entrenched up there. Uh, any other takeaways from this roster as we head into the meat and potatoes of, of spring camp? A little concerned about tackle just because I wasn't enamored with Miles Hinton at right tackle last year. And now he's going to left and you know that dreaded P word potential. And is he going to reach it? So I've uh, heard he's been banged up maybe a little bit. Uh, Gio Ohati maybe banged up a little bit. Josh Preeb is really kind of the guy. And he was the third big team, all big 10 guy last year. So let's not just pretend that he's not a good player, right? Just because he wasn't here last year. Look at Drake Nugent. Look at Olu Oluwatimi the year before him. So I think that Preeb is going to be almost like the anchor of this line. I think your question marks are center and then the tackle positions. Uh, I love the fact that you're going to have a, a couple of really good guards in there and anxious to see how the rest of it plays out. Um, to me, that's, you know what, these guys, again, they're going against the best defensive line in the country. So they're, they're getting an education here and it's going to get easier for them when they play in games because they are playing against guys like Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant, who nobody can move the ball on. Frankly, those guys proved it uh, all last year that they were probably the best interior line in college football and they're back for another year. And they're going to be better than ever. So um, I'm anxious to see as well um, how the receivers do uh, and, how patient some of these guys are. You know what worries me is if they don't get a quarterback, you know, are these guys going to stick around? Like you said, Clay, if it's going to be a guy, if they're going to catch 300 yards and passes, they can go out to Oregon. For example, say Oregon comes to Colston Loveland and says, we're going to throw you a ton of balls. Do you have a quarterback that can get, can get you the ball? Uh, that worries me a little bit. So let's see what happens. And um, that and NIL money also concerns me. Promises. Bills are coming due, fellas. Uh, I've talked to a couple of parents who have said, look, you know, we're still waiting on our money. Uh, promises are made. They are going to have to pay these guys if they want to keep them here. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one, one of the things we know, too, is it just feels like, you know, and every guy just about that we've talked to this spring has been asked this, where what are the differences between practice or just the program in general under Jim Harbaugh and under Sharon Moore? And it's very similar, um, you know, from what everybody has said. And as TJ guy said today, it's early. So, you know, they'll find out more differences as time goes along. But right now, and I thought Angelique Shangelis asked a great question too. It's like last year, you guys were motivated by the TCU loss. What is kind of motivating you and fueling you right now? And they said, it's upholding the standard that we've already set as 15 and 0 national champions. And that that's motivation enough. So it sounds like it's been competitive um, in, in listening to Josh Preeb talk about the differences between Northwestern and Michigan was really fascinating. He said, it's kind of like a whole different level in terms of the physicality, 
the competition, the overall intensity, the length of practices. So it sounds like that hasn't changed because when Jim Harbaugh came in that first spring in 2015, it was like, we're not meeting. We're doing four hours on the practice field. However many hours we get, we're going to be on the field. You get better at football by playing football. You know, I'm, I'm sure they kind of scaled that down a little bit throughout his tenure, but they still spend a lot more time on the field than most of these other teams. It feels like operationally from what guys have said, it's very similar to what the program was under Jim Harbaugh, which, you know, makes you, makes you feel, you know, confident about the future. Also, you know, clearly they're, they're still going to have to coach well and, and players are going to have to play well. They're going to have to get talent in there. Like you can't just make it a carbon copy and expect the results to be, gonna, uh, to be the same. But right now, when you do have a lot of the same guys around, I think that can be something that they, they carry forward. So I think that's, that's something that we know uh, through 10 practices is the culture is very similar. The operation's very similar. And we also, we found out a new drill today, the, the quest to Atlanta drill, of course, National Championship game in Atlanta, January 20th, 2025. Get your plane tickets now. Get your hotel reservations now because Michigan, and anytime they've come out with any of these drills, the beat Ohio drill, the beat Georgia drill that had to be changed to the beat uh, Bama drill because Georgia couldn't beat Bama in Atlanta, coincidentally. Uh, you know, they've checked those boxes off and beaten those teams. They haven't lost to Ohio State ever since they implemented that drill. So the, the quest to Atlanta drill is 11 on 11, good on good. Heavy personnel, stacked box, run the ball, pretty much the beat Georgia and Bama drill. Uh, so they're coming for it. They, they, they got their sights set on Atlanta. Let's move over to the defensive side of the ball now. And I think the thing that sticks out to me the most is, you know, we're going to cover an NFL draft here in a few weeks where Michigan has a legitimate chance to set this record of, of 16 guys selected and obviously comes from both sides of the ball. But you go through each defensive position group. And, you know, Mason Graham, Kenneth Graham, th both of those guys could be first round picks next year. Uh, Will Johnson, that's a guy who I think is easily a first round pick next year, assuming good health. Um, you know, at linebacker, you've got, you know, Ernest Hausman. I think he's a future NFL guy. Jay Sean Barham's a future NFL guy. Um, you know, you've got two experienced safeties that, you know, uh, Quentin Johnson, was going to give the NFL draft a shot and didn't quite have that interest, but you would think a sixth year at Michigan probably puts him into the mix for that. Macari Page certainly could have been in the mix for that. And then uh, Josiah Stewart, Derek Moore could also be guys that, you know, um, you know, Jalen Harrell and Brad McGregor in the draft this year, they combined for 11 sacks. Those two guys, I'll say somewhat quietly combined for 10 and a half last year. So bigger roles from them could make them NFL draft picks. And to me, you know, we're talking about, I think what made Michigan's defense historic last year was one, the fact that they were able to play so many guys because of the way that the schedule started. And Jesse Minter had, a, you know, did a great job cultivating that depth. And there are a little more, you know, a few more questions about depth this time around. But, you know, when you're talking about a defense that could have, let's just say as many as three or four first round picks on it, that's when you do start to maybe, you know, when they talk about wanting to be better than last year, again, that bar was set so high. But when you have that level of talent, I'm not putting it past them to be able to do that. And everybody, you know, and part of it's going to depend on how much the offense moves the ball, right? you got to play complementary football. If they're on the field all the time, they can get tired, especially if they don't have the depth that they had last year that you just talked about, Anthony. So that's going to be something to watch. Uh, I like TJ Guy a lot. Looks pretty good. Uh, from everything we've heard on the edge, uh, he's going to be one of the – probably the third guy – and uh, to me, the linebackers, though, we'll have a report up on this tomorrow, but the linebackers have been one of the pleasant surprises of the spring. So extremely athletic. This whole defense is extremely athletic. You're going to have to find another corner, right? We've talked about DJ Waller. He's bigger, he's a strider. Uh, you talk about Will Johnson, though, locking down half the field and Wink Martindale, Michigan's defensive coordinator. There's a reason he's smiling all the time, fellas. Look at what he inherited, uh, especially up front, man, with Graham and Grant. And I said about Graham the first time I saw him, this guy is the best true freshman at this at this point in his career that I've ever seen. And I said that throughout his first year. Last year, best sophomore I've seen. I expect he'll be the best junior and that he's going to elevate his game. So it's only going to be better. I think you're right, Anthony. So the big question, again, is the depth. Who's that third linebacker? Jimmy Rolder? Is he going to be able to step up? Uh, somebody's going to have to. Is that other corner going to be able to play like Josh Wallace played last year? That's going to be 
a big question mark. Wallace was one of the underrated players on that team, fellas. I went back and watched a lot of games, and uh, everybody remembers the one or two that he got beat on. That guy was around the ball all the time. So, uh, and the way the safeties are playing is encouraging. Going to have a little note on Zeke Berry tomorrow as well. So, to me, I expect those guys to dominate not just the Michigan team in practice, the obviously the offense that they're going against on a daily basis, but I think they are going to be really, really good going to be one of the best defenses in the country again it's about protecting them and not make, and making sure they're not on the field all the time yeah the, the rod Moore injury obviously hurts but you know I, I think to your point ab is there are kind of you know a, a couple guys at each level of the defense at least um that you can really trust and that have played a lot of football here and have played a, a lot of good football i mean just on the defensive line you have josiah stewart and Derek moore on the edges, and then the the two big boys on the interior, Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant, and it leaves you wondering, like, you know, Derek Moore was talking about some play last week that Mason Graham made that he didn't want to talk about and give away too much, but he said it was incredible. It was one of the craziest things he's ever seen. I'm thinking, you know, what the hell did this guy do? Uh, but, you know, <laughs> these guys are, you know, going to come into their own, I think, as juniors and, and really be the strength of the defense. Like you said, Chris, I mean, the depth, Definitely isn't what it was last year because all those, you know, KG didn't start last year. Josiah didn't start last year. Either did Derek Moore. You know, Ernest Hausman was the third linebacker. So you kind of need those those other guys to step up into the depth positions. Um, but you have to like, you know, at least a couple guys at every level. And, uh, you know, even Josh Preeb talking about it. He said, I've played a lot of great interior defensive linemen in the Big Ten and around the country, you know, during his time at Northwestern. He said, you know, you'd have a great guy like, you know, some D lines would have one great guy, but now to have two on the interior, it's incredibly tough to deal with. So I think it starts up front for this defense. And then you got the Will Johnsons of the world on the back end. And yeah, got to fill some holes and, and have guys step into, you know, bigger, bigger roles this year. But there's a lot of talent on that side. Yes, it is. And outside of uh, that number two corner job, again, I feel we'll see who winds up winning that a couple guys in DJ Waller, Jair Hill, who, um, you know, Hill more so than Waller, maybe some freshman maturity stuff that needed to be worked through, but Waller, they like the way that he came in and handled his business. And again, I think that if you're going to have a pretty quality number two there, um, given that you've got that guy on the other side that takes so much pressure off of them. So um, any other lingering spring thoughts uh before we get into questions at the end of the show not for me just worried about the kicker a little bit quarterback and kicker guys to me uh are the biggest concerns on this team right now and that but that's a you know obviously quarterback not ideal uh kicker not ideal but there's a reason there's a portal out there guys look what they did with james turner you know last year that guy was arguably you know what the difference in the ohio state game the kicks that he made right uh were just clutch. So uh, go find a quarterback and I'm feeling really, really good about this team. And then I'm not thinking ahead yet to 2025, which scares me a little bit. Any other kickers out there uh, in the portal that are from Saline, Michigan? That would be. That's be a nice. great question. But uh, gotta if be there are one. Clayton Safey, he is the uh, the uh, vice president of the champion circle now, I think. Is that right? So, <laughs> and he'll write you a check. So <laughs> Big check. Yeah, big check. Anywho, all right, well, uh, let's get into questions now. And we'll start with this one from Nick for $1.99. Uh, the super chat function here live on YouTube if you want to move yourself to the front of the line. Use that donate button below. It says, thoughts on Miller Moss from USC if he were to transfer? I mean, if that would be the guy, if he was available, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, he's going to be in a battle with, I believe the young man's name is Jaden My Mayava, uh, transferred in from UNLV, so... Uh, you know, again, USC is going to have a pretty heated battle. Um, Florida's a team that's going to have a pretty heated battle between Graham Mertz and a five-star freshman in DJ Lagway. Uh, so, again, I, I think when you look at, you know, the schools where there's not, you know, one logical guy, but a couple guys you could see starting as opposed to a school like Michigan where, you know, they're hoping and praying that guy's there. Yeah, I think that fits the bill. But, um yeah, that's that's the thing is uh, we don't know who's available yet. So, but if he were available, that'd be a guy I would probably be interested in. And if they're smart, these schools are going to be like it's neck and neck. You know, we're going into fall. We don't know who our leader is. You know, and uh, so both of these guys are going to think they're going to be the guy, and uh, maybe have one guy say one thing and one coach would say another or whatever. You're the guy. Just you know, do whatever. We'll see how it works out. But you know what? Um, they got to get somebody, fellas, and they got to start back channeling now. 
yeah, Miller Moss had the the one good bowl game that kind of, you know, kind of interestingly made it where it's like USC wasn't going to go after uh, a transfer in the portal. It's like, okay, we kind of got our guy for next season, but he still has to win the job. And I think there are, there are kind of two options of who you could get. It would be somebody who loses a battle like that. And like you said, CB, I mean, it, it, a lot of these battles are going to be kind of drawn out. They may even go with the Michigan method, start one guy, one game, the next guy, the next, um, you know, and that, that might not be the dumbest idea these days. And it, it worked out well for Michigan, even though one guy pretty much checked out halfway through the season, but they still went 13 and 0 that year, you know, heading into the post post season. So uh, it, it can work. Um, but it, you know, I think it could be somebody like that that loses a battle or even a starter at, at a place that, you know, isn't set up as well as Michigan is. And maybe, you know, that that's definitely where the back channeling would come into, into play. I don't think a guy like that just enters without knowing what his options are going to be, but they're going to, you know, things are going to be kept quiet and, you know, something could pop up. You know, you look around the country too at an Alabama, for example, they got a few talented guys, Jalen Milrose coming back and, and they got some talented guys behind him that, you know, could want to play. So there are a lot of different places, uh, you know, that, that, you know, you can kind of monitor and, and look at in, uh, you know, the next few weeks are going to be really, really exciting. I think to see who enters the portal and, you know, I, I don't love it uh, the way college football is gone, but there are going to be a lot of names and a lot of news. A player to be named later in the Keon Sab trade. It could be yeah. If, yeah. if you go from Alabama. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's think too is like something that we can't even quantify yet or or speculate on is if there are schools out there that you know have a their their guys you know entrenched on paper. There is no battle. Then all of a sudden, you know, the collective steps up and wants to pull this guy from another school who was a surprise to enter the portal. And all of a sudden the incumbent guy uh, knows he wants to start. So there's just so again, I, not crazy about how all of this is in college football now, but you know, sometimes you have to deal in it with the way things are not in the way you'd like them to be. So a uh, school like Michigan defending national champion, big 10 power, one of the cash cows of your conference, you need to be the poacher and not the poached. And that's that goes beyond just the quarterback position. That goes to, um, you know, taking care of your own guys that we've talked about on defense, uh, taking care of guys who might be hearing from other schools. Uh, it's it's beyond time to be a little proactive here, and uh, hopefully they are because, um, yeah, those reviews at the quarterback position just aren't quite there yet. So uh, let's move to this one on the message board from Sasquatch six one six who wants to know, uh, fellas, and I'll, I'll leave both of you to have the floor on this one. What was more exciting, watching the Eclipse or watching Iowa's offensive highlights from last season? By far the Eclipse, 100%. Although, with the amusement level in, I in Iowa with their offense at times, uh, maybe I'll call it a wash. But uh, that was kind of funny, right? There were times other when Eric Hall went down, they, they absolutely had nothing. And uh, so, a great question, though, Sasquatch. I would expect nothing less. I didn't know there were offensive highlights from Iowa, and I did watch the Eclipse. So there were I'll have a couple two-yard runs. True. And, you know, yeah. they they made a play or two. You know, it's darn tough to move the ball in this league, as they say. So, um, <laughs> you know, there were a couple plays maybe against Michigan, but they got shut out there. That was the most Iowa offense I, I watched, and it was actually quite enjoyable. So, I, you know, maybe I'll switch my answer. It was pretty fun watching <laughs> that Iowa offense against Michigan and a 26 to nothing win. Yeah, the uh... – the best Iowa offense was any time that the ball was in Cooper DeShane's hands, which was True. he's you know defensive back. So uh, and also and a punt returner, and then he was yeah. hurt and out for most of the year. So yeah. uh, the eclipse, the eclipse was, I mean, for some of you nerds who weren't in the path of totality or near it, uh, sorry that your day wasn't as cool as as those of ours up around these parts. But uh, pretty cool stuff. I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, Iowa actually hurts my eyes, whereas the <laughs> sun, you know could take the appropriate precautions for that. Uh, let's go to one from uh, Hoops Coach N3D, who says, I know this topic has been around for, unfortunately, way too long, but are there any concrete progresses made on NIL? Uh, Sean McGee with football, and will May be hired – Or I'm sorry, will May be allowed to hire his own GM? Yes, I think he will. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, but have there been, yeah, there has been progress. Has there been enough? No. As I mentioned today, I've been talking to a parent who's been waiting, you know, his son's been waiting for money and they love him and everything else. Are they going to have the money to keep him? Um, not necessarily a starter, but a guy that's been repping with ones and twos 
uh, who could really help this team win. And really, it shouldn't be an issue at this point, guys. I keep, you know, I hate keep banging on it, but for God's sake, this is Michigan for God's sake, right? So find the money, keep these guys here. And I can only imagine how hard it's going to be for Dusty May. I hope that if Ward Manuel did make some promises to him that they are being upheld. And it, what's his name? I mean, Dusty May did say that it's going to be up to him, right? He's going to spend 25 to 30% of his time on fundraising and NIL and stuff like that too. So he's going to have to do that to land some of these guys, but still a ways to go guys. You're playing from behind. No doubt. Yeah, that's, it's going to be difficult. Um, I just, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that Arkansas is able to pull John Calipari because they have the Tyson chicken money behind them. Is there not someone like Tyson chicken esque associated with U of M that, there's no Walmart burns for football or burns for basketball. Clay, it's it's Clay, weird. Clay's uh, family owns some establishments. What are they? Parkway Tropics is Parkway one of them. Tropics, yeah. I would imagine they rake in some bucks. So uh, yeah, I've seen some money there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next uh, question. Question. <laughs> we'll go to the next one here. Um, this is from Maze and Blue on the message board. He says it's been three months since the football team had a commitment. Is there any chance we get? any by the spring game or all these kids waiting until summer and fall. I will first say uh, our recruiting guys are live on this channel on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I would encourage you to check their show out as well. We I'm sure they haven't, they haven't gotten that question yet. No, it's a, it's a completely unique question. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, I mean, we can only kind of go by what they tell us and thought maybe chance for one or a few coming off this visit weekend, but it doesn't look like anything's going to materialize for that. Nope. Next question. That's the answer to that question. All right. Disappointing. Uh, it's from Blue Thunder 24 it says, any updates on if alcohol sales will be extended to the big house this fall? And what is the reluctance to install Wi-Fi when every stadium in the NFL has managed to do so? Um, alcohol is coming to the big house this fall. Uh, they've, I think that's been confirmed. Um, it's at Yoast. It's been at Chrysler Center down the stretch with God bless him. I mean, the fans certainly needed that down the stretch if you came out for a men's basketball game. But uh, the plan, I, th I believe the plans are fully in motion for uh, beverages of some sort to be available at Michigan Stadium. Yeah, and we usually bring our own. And I'm not condoning this, yeah. but a lot of people put them in their socks, you know, maybe a pint or something like that, or their inside pocket. Again, you know, don't shoot the messenger here. But uh, yeah, many people. I've never had a problem having alcohol at the big house, so I can't speak for others. Yeah. yeah, my my dad said when he back when he went there. I mean, there were, you know, the security wasn't that great, but people were bringing full kegs in the student yeah. section. So yeah, the good could, old days, baby. You could get away with more back in the day, but yeah, I mean, Michigan was slow even on this. Uh, Michigan State had alcohol sales after it got passed, you know, last fall. I guess that's another case. AB kind of like Michigan men's basketball, where it's like you kind of need that if you're going to be watching that football team. I, I again, I enjoyed watching them. Last year in East Lansing, mm -hmm. forty-nine nothing game there uh, in late October. But yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see the the reviews from the fans on that. But we will not be we will not be partaking, unfortunately. We just uh, partake in the brownies that Ballas brings up to the press box every week. So true. Yeah. They're just no chocolate. Count. There's nothing else in there. They There's should no have Wi-Fi too. No comment on which side. Yeah, and I will. And yeah, I will say this though. Yeah, the Wi-Fi thing is a joke, right? That thing that should have been sorted out so many years ago. It's it's absurd. Who do we blame? It, I mean, it's it's crazy in general because as cool as it is to have, you know, whatever, 115,000 people all in this one little condensed area watching a football game, you know, I park a decent amount away from the stadium, probably a few blocks away from Pioneer. And the second I get out to stadium, I have no cell service and it yeah. reaches that far. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's that's too inside baseball for the tech people for me. I don't know how any of that works. I just yeah. know that. If I get out of my car um, to walk to the stadium, I do not make contact with anyone until I'm pretty much in the seat next to you guys. So right. um, yeah. people might question if I'm in danger or not. So anyway, <laughs> uh, we have time for a few more questions. Otherwise, we can let's just do one more. Here. Get out of here. Get ready for uh, we got Dan Gold's question. Do we? Donovan Edwards? Will they catch him? My answer is no. No, they I still love have that. Meme. I love that meme. Like your opponent has left the game or whatever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> on Donovan's yeah. second run against Ohio State. Uh, I will say this: Kalel Mullings is showing out, fellas, uh, this spring. 
You guys can read about that at the wolverine.com. But I, I liked him last year. I thought he should have gotten more carries, even with Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards out there. I think Kalel Mullings is going to be one of those guys that really emerges. Kalel said thunder and lightning. They're bringing it back. He's thunder. Donovan's lightning. Uh, should be a good tandem. And then Jordan Marshall gets here in the summer. I'm just excited to see him, too. Wish we could see him in the spring game. Spring game. And uh, Benjamin Hall. Benjamin Hall, as Blake Corum said, after he threw out the first pitch against uh, the for the Detroit Tigers, he said, yep. hey, that's my guy. He really likes him. So. Exciting. Hey, would it have? Uh, I mean, we're all we're all Tigers fans here. Would it have been any worse if they just let Blake Corum take a few more swings? I said that. Game? I said that on the message. I said let him pitch. Flaherty's fastball was not moving. I mean, there was it was right down. Boom. There was no movement on him. I, I don't know. You know, couldn't have been worse. So, well, just I'll, we though. we can end it this way. Yep. Um, God bless Michigan man uh, and Tigers pitching coach Chris Fetter. Amen. That's he's why they have a shot to do anything this year. So. I still love this. Uh, hey, you know what? Six and three is better than three and six. Uh, on to Pittsburgh now. Uh, big two games here. And then they uh, – Minnesota. the funny thing is Minnesota Twins come here this weekend. Chris Ballas and I head to Minnesota this week for the Frozen Four. Uh, excited for that Thursday night game. Uh, we will both be in attendance for that. Uh, so big week there. We'll have the coverage from there. Obviously, spring ball. We'll have coaches this week. Uh, talking as well uh, as we head into the final week of spring football. And then Clayton, you and I have to figure out when we're doing our, our annual spring game draft. I haven't even thought about a board yet, but this is as wide open a uh, a field as maybe it's ever been. So uh, I'm excited, excited to do that as well. So a lot of great stuff coming to the Wolverine.com. Again, uh, be sure to use that promo code UM1 for two months of access to the site for $1 for our YouTube subscribers only. It's going to pay for itself because Basketball transfer portal, as you see, is coming in hot and heavy. Football transfer portal with both guys in and out. Uh, we figure we'll be busy here uh, coming out of spring ball. So we'll have the intel from all of that. More on Dusty May's staff, more on other developments from inside uh, both the football and basketball programs and, and some great coverage from uh, the Frozen Four, too. Hopefully coverage that goes well into the weekend. We'll see what happens there. But uh, for Chris Ballas, for Clayton Safey, for our producer, Megan, behind the scenes. I'm Anthony Broom. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, and we will talk to you again next time.